Hello, everybody. We are um, we're just waiting for the participants to come in. Um, just wait until the number stabilizes a little bit and then we'll we'll start. But welcome on this not so windy February day. My goodness, we have had some atrocious weather the last few few days, haven't we? And I hope wherever you are, it's calm down. It's not raining. It's not snowing. And you've got the heating on for as long as we can afford it, because isn't the price hike in April, I think? Or has it already started? I don't know. Don't want to think about it. <laughs> I'm just going to... A few more seconds. If, uh, if everybody's on the call like is like me I've got five or six clocks in the house and each one of them is on a different time including my phone so <laughs> what's two o'clock in one room is 202 in another or <laughs> so it's always best to give people that two three minute buffer anyway I think we I think we can start now. Hello, Trevor McLeese. Nice to have you here. Um, so, DWP and Microlink. Um, this is our fourth, third, fourth, fourth session. Um, and today we have Dr. Neil Rogers, who's head of Hi. digital accessibility at Microlink. Hello, Neil. Thank you for joining Hi, us. And we also have um, Dr. Nasser Siabi, who is the CEO of Microlink, who's also going to say a few words. Um, today's all about, you know, we all work on online and on computers and everything is, 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 is digital. So how do you make sure that everything you do is accessible, um, not only for people with disabilities, but for everybody in general? Um, so Neil's going to be talking about that today. A um, bit of housekeeping. Uh, we have, uh, we're using uh, a transcription service, which is um, Interact Streamer, so you should be able to see that. Um, and we will be sharing a recording and a transcript afterwards, along with um, the resource page. So you can, you know, anything that Neil mentions in this uh, presentation, you will receive afterwards. So now I'm going to say bye, and I'm going to hand you over to NASA. Um. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining uh, these webinar uh, sessions. Um, and I think, uh, obviously, the introduction to digital accessibility, is, um, um, which is Neil is going to talk about, has become extremely important in today's um, age of um, maximum engagement with customers, with employees with disabilities. So I think it's really right for me to hand over to our, our expert here, and Neil, and then we'll take it away. Neil, thank you. Okay, well, uh, thank you very much for that introduction. I uh, really appreciate it. Um, so I, I just, um, to say that we're going to be covering uh, essentially four main areas in this uh, this webinar today. So uh, the first off is, you know, uh, what do we mean by digital, digital accessibility? Uh, also thinking about accessibility from the start. Uh, also, uh, whether or not your website's accessible and why all your documents must be accessible. Uh, and then that'll, you know, I'll, I'll then finish with a, a take home message. But before I, I do that, I just want to very briefly um, give you a, a little bit of a background about, about Microlink. Um, so the, the company itself was established in uh, 1992. Uh, and we're working within the higher education uh, and workplace sectors. And we've helped well over half a million disabled people to succeed in uh, education and in employment. Uh, and the company itself is operating uh, in the UK, uh, also the US, uh, South Africa, and the, the Middle East. Uh, we also have a portfolio of well over 20 major clients, uh, many of whom are Fortune 500 companies.
So in this uh, section, I'm just going to be looking at you know, what we actually mean by digital accessibility. So it's, it's, it's going to be broken down into two parts. And we're going to be looking at, so what digital, digital accessibility is itself, uh, the definition of accessibility, um, and also going to be covering web accessibility standards and guidelines and other standards and guidelines. And then there'll be, there'll be a little bit of the legal bit. I won't go too heavily into that. Um, so just what is digital accessibility? Well, it's the process of ensuring that digital technologies, uh, services and resources, um, such as websites, you know, mobile applications, uh, eBooks and documents such as PDFs are well, first off, that they're designed with the needs of disabled people and uh, additional needs in mind, and that they are flexible and can be customized uh, or changed to meet individual needs. It also uh, is about uh, that they are created uh, compatible with assistive technology, uh, such as screen readers. Now, a, a great example of that is uh, a free screen reader called NVDA. I'm sure you've probably come across others such as JAWS and, and, and so on. Uh, it's also important that um, uh, th these aspects or products are compliant or services are compliant with uh, recognized accessibility guidance and regulations. Before I go any further, I just want to just to, to, to give a very um, brief but useful definition of accessibility. Um, it's, it's really, really rather simple, is whether or not something is usable by disabled people. Uh, so that's, that's a very helpful way of looking at accessibility, is to think of, is it usable by disabled people? Uh, more of that in a bit. So the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines, or WCAG, um, uh, it, it essentially it started out as uh, uh, I think it's yeah WCAG 1.0. It's, it's it then moved on to WCAG 2.0, uh, which is uh, an international standard. And the uh, the Web Accessibility Initiative uh, provided a really helpful uh, overview uh, of of those guidelines. And I'll put a, a link in the presentation here, which I can share uh, with everyone afterwards, um, just in terms of help, helpful uh, information. Also, just to point out that uh, the uh, web uh, content accessibility guidelines have different uh, uh, versions. So we're currently, or the most current version is WCAG 2.1. Um, and this builds on uh, WCAG 2.0, uh, but doesn't replace it. And uh, WCAG 2.1 double uh, 2.1 has a variety of different levels. So you've got A, double A and triple A. It's just worth bearing that in mind. Uh, also, just to, to move on uh, to, to state that there are um, yeah, imminent and future releases of, of the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines. So uh, this 2.2 is to be released very shortly. I think it's going to be released in June this year. Uh, and then also to say WCAG 3.0 uh, is on the horizon. I also just want to bring your attention to uh, other standards and guidelines that relate to uh, uh, essentially ensuring um, you're meeting your digital accessibility um, uh, obligations. And so there's, for example, uh, for mobile applications, there's EN301549. Uh, it's, I, th I think it's a European, European standard. And then there's also PDF and EPUB3, which you, you may have heard of. So what I want you to do now is to just to think of uh, or imagine a ladder. And so the first rung of that ladder is, uh, is essentially compliance or relating to compliance. So for example, you know, the web content accessibility guidelines. Um, uh, although some would uh, argue that it's probably not actually quite the first rung of the ladder. Um, but that's, uh, that's for another conversation some other time. But anyway, so just imagine that the first rung of the ladder is you know, your, your web content accessibility guidelines. Now, what we're wanting to do is we're wanting to help people to, uh, to get to the top of the ladder and to essentially look out over the top. 
Uh, and the top of the ladder is essentially where we make sure that uh, digital technologies, services and resources are usable by disabled people. So just to, just to think of that, um, uh, just, yeah, to, just to think about, you know, keep that in mind as, as we go through the presentation. So what I'm going to do now is just to cover very briefly uh, a bit about uh, uh, the, the legal side of things. Now, I'm sure that um, for many of you, particularly in the DWP, will be aware of the public sector bodies accessibility regulations. Uh, but just so that we're all singing from the same hymn sheet, so to speak, uh, uh, essentially um, the public sector bodies accessibility re regulations or PS bar, um, it's less of a mouthful, it has to be said, um, is, make, is to essentially make sure that uh, public sector organizations uh, have a legal duty to ensure that their websites and mobile applications meet accessibility regulations. Um, and just to point out that uh, right now, uh, all public sector websites must be accessible and compliant to, uh, to work out 2.1 level AA. Uh, the sources to, to include and update an accessibility statement on, uh, on those websites. Um, and certainly as, as part of uh, best practice, Microlink would recommend they review their accessibility statements on, on a regular basis. Uh, that's, that's quite important. I think just to state here that uh, uh, the Central Digital and Data Office, or CDDDO, uh, provide a free template for a sample accessibility statement. So it's, it's well worth having a, a look at that um, and just you know, very useful information that they provide. Also, just want to very briefly cover here a, a bit about the Equality Act 2010. Uh, so, uh, under the Equality Act, uh, public sector organisations have to make changes in, in their approach uh, or uh, perhaps their, their provision uh, to ensure that services are accessible to uh, disabled people as well uh, as everybody else. So also uh, the reasonable adjustments include uh, alterations to uh, perhaps you know, uh, buildings. Uh, so you know, whether that's sort of providing uh, lifts or, or wider doorways, particularly for a wheelchair user, that's helpful. Uh, you know, ramps uh, and signage uh, that, that can actually be touched. Uh, it also might include you know, changes to, to policy, um, but particularly you know, procedures uh, and staff training uh, to, to, to essentially just to make sure that your services uh, work uh, you know, really well and equally well uh, for, for disabled people. So just in part two, what I want to do is uh, to cover you know, who is impacted by digital accessibility and what assistive technology is. Uh, then to just to, to talk very briefly about disability worldwide and to give you some figures on that. And then also to, to look at digital accessibility and how that benefits everyone. So who is actually impacted by uh, digital accessibility? Well, the, the goal for digital products is that they're usable by disabled people. So, you know, without vision or with limited vision, uh, without perception uh, of color. Uh, so this means uh, for people who may be colorblind and without hearing or with limited hearing. Just to point out that I am paraphrasing there from, from, from Lexdis. Uh, it's a, a very useful website to also to look at. It's got a lot of useful information on. Um, so moving on, the, so uh, uh, the, as we I mentioned, the goal is for digital products to be usable by disabled people with uh, also with limited dexterity and with limited cognition. So, you know, such as uh, autism or dys dyslexia. Uh, and in, in terms of, you know, perhaps with dexterity, it's uh, a person may not be able to move their fingers or, or hands very easily. And then also, uh, finally, uh, without uh, speech. So now I just want to uh, just bring to your attention uh, a definition for, for what assistive technology is, just simply so that everyone is aware of, of, of this. 
Um, I'm sure many are um, do, do know this, but it's essentially it is, and this is an official definition, uh, is any item or piece of equipment, uh, software, uh, program or product system that is used to increase, maintain, or improve the functional capabilities of a disabled person. So just moving on here, I wanna to just to talk about uh, disability worldwide. So uh, on average, approximately 20% of the global population, certainly within the, 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 Western, the Western world, uh, have a disability that impacts their use of uh, digital services and, and resources. Uh, just to point out, uh, this, this does depend on which figures you read and can be as little as 12% uh, or as much as 26%. Uh, just to also say that the 20% figure is likely to be higher because of what we, we refer to as undisclosed disabilities. Um, and remember too that uh, not all disabilities are visible and that many people may not see themselves as actually having, having a disability. So essentially by addressing uh, digital accessibility, uh, ultimately everybody benefits. And this is referred to, or what we, we refer to as digital inclusion. So uh, just want to, 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 to give you like a scenario. So, so think of some steps, uh, you know, for if, and if you're a wheelchair user and you, know, you come across those steps, um, this, this creates a barrier for you and it can prevent you from actually entering a building. So as you can see from this diagram, um, that you know, it, it's whether you can go upstairs, and in some cases, actually going downstairs could potentially cause an injury. So um, it's, it's those sorts of things that, that can cause a barrier for a wheelchair user. But just to think now, so if, okay, if a ramp uh, is put in place, this would really you know, completely solve the problem. But just to point out, this is where it's, uh, we, we then started to move into inclusion is that this actually helps everyone. Um, so it might be other people such as maybe a, a parent or a child uh, in, a, in a buggy uh, or an adult uh, with mobility issues. And you know, so they, they can use the ramp. So essentially what we're saying here is it's, it's not just disabled people that would be helped by having a ramp, everybody would benefit from a ramp. And so essentially that, that uh, principle is referred to as universal design. I, again, I've provided a link here in the presentation um, that you can have a look at you know, uh, when, when, when you want to. So what I want to now to do is to just to move on to thinking about accessibility uh, from the start. So I'm, I'm gonna be covering you know, essentially what born accessible workflows are, uh, best practice and writing for accessibility uh, and also designing for, for web accessibility. And then I'll, I'll, I'll cover uh, a bit about automatic web accessibility evalu evaluation tools. Bit of a mouthful, that one. So born accessible workflows, well, what are they? Well, uh, there's a, a, a definition provided by um, a gentleman called, uh, uh, called Kasdorf, and, and he's in the publishing sector here, here in the UK, and he defines it in this way. So I'm just going to read it out because it's actually an official definition. So uh, the best solution is to build accessibility into the publication workflow from the outset, as this can dramatically reduce the cost and the effort required to make publications accessible. So it's, it's worth, worth bearing in that that in mind and essentially that's called a born accessible workflow. So in terms of uh, best practice, uh, what we'd recommend is authoring accessible digital content uh, uh, that essentially it, that it would prevent future remediation. And we recommend uh, you know, habit forming approaches when authoring documents uh, that, that minimize accessibility barriers. Uh, and also to ensure that uh, all of your stakeholders are aware of this information, uh, it, it will really help them. Also just to point out that uh, there's uh, manual intervention. And so this includes the authoring of uh, you know, digital content uh, by stakeholders and intervention by 
uh, accessibility experts you know, involved in what we, we call accessibility reviews or digital accessibility reviews. There's also automatic and semi-automatic tools that are available, and these can help you to do the, uh, the heavy lifting. And, but just to point out that they can throw up a lot of what we call false positives. So essentially those are um, essentially areas that uh, aren't really problems, um, uh, but they just flagged up because that, that's the way computers operate. So just, to, and because of that, it's important to, to remember that you need to use both manual and automatic approaches. So I'm now just gonna move on to, you know, writing, writing for web accessibility. And essentially this is information that's actually provided on the, um, uh, the web accessibility initiative uh, website. And they, they provide you know, really useful guidance on writing for, for web accessibility. So uh, that would cover for example, you're know, providing um, uh, informative and unique page titles on your website. Uh, and also, uh, again, really important and helpful this for, for screen reader users is using headings to help convey meaning and structure. Uh, that's very important for screen reader users. So just to, just to emphasize that. Um, and then uh, also to, to make links that you provide meaningful. So for example, uh, to, to avoid terms such as click here. I'm sure you've seen that on quite a number of websites. Um, that just causes problems for, for uh, uh, screen reader users. Also just to move on to, uh, uh, to also to write meaningful text alternatives for images, uh, and then to create uh, transcripts and captions for multimedia. Uh, and then to also provide you know, really clear instructions on your website uh, to, to, help, uh, to help users, particularly disabled people. And then to keep your content uh, you know, really clear and concise. Um, uh, and that will certainly help uh, uh, users who perhaps have cognitive impairments, uh, such as autism or perhaps uh, dyslexia. So now I'm just gonna move on to to refer to um, designing for web accessibility. And again, the WA pro provide uh, some really useful guidance on this. So one of the other aspects that they suggest is to provide sufficient contrast between foreground and background uh, in terms of color. Um, this, is, this would be helpful not only for those who have visual impairments, but also those who are, are perhaps uh, dyslexic. Uh, also, just to say that uh, to, to not use color alone to convey information. So that would help you know, people, particularly help people if you're colorblind. And then to ensure that uh, interactive elements are easy to identify. And then to, to make sure you provide you know, clear and uh, consistent navigation options throughout, throughout your website. To, to also ensure that you know, form elements uh, include clearly associated labels. Uh, that's again particularly important for screen reader users. Otherwise, uh, just to give an example, so you know, if you're using a screen reader, um, you, it's about both input and output. So if you're trying to interact with something and, and a form label, so for example, like a login page or something like that, um, if it's not, uh, the labels aren't provided for that, it can make it very difficult for a screen reader user to be able to use a login page. Also recommend providing uh, easily identifiable feedback. And then to, again, use headings and spacing to, to group uh, related content. Uh, that's, that is really important. Um, and then to create uh, designs for, for different uh, viewport sizes. So essentially for, for different sort of your device, device screen sizes, et cetera. Um, uh, again, that's really important to, to take on board. Uh, and then to include uh, image and media alternatives in your design. Uh, so that, that's, that's useful to, again to, to many disabled people if you, if you, if you do that. Um, and then to provide controls for content that starts automatically. So that's just a sort of a very, very um, you know, whistle stop tour, if you like, of designing for, for web accessibility. So I'm now just going to cover uh, again very briefly about uh, uh, automatic uh, web accessibility evaluation tools. And essentially there are three types. 
And so there's you know, proprietary platforms. Uh, there's also free trials uh, and then also free or open source um, uh, evaluation tools. Uh, I certainly can recommend using things like Axe or, or the Wave uh, tool. Uh, also, um, user first provides some very useful uh, tools. Um, I was also going to say that uh, there's another uh, tool called uh, Ting Tung Check, and I think that's that's completely free, so open source, uh, and it, it, that also provides um, uh, useful tips and uh, um, essentially guidance on uh, checking PDFs as well. So in terms of part two, uh, thinking about accessibility from the start, um, I'm going to cover uh, essentially Office 365. So that's uh, for Microsoft Word desktop. Uh, and then for uh, the Microsoft Word accessibility checker. And then I'm going to cover alternative text descriptions to, hyper, uh, to hyperlinks. And then uh, talking very briefly about templates and accessibility checker rules. So for uh, Office 365, Microsoft Word, uh, this is just some, some basically helpful guidelines uh, when, when creating uh, or authoring um, you know, Word documents. Uh, and, and it's important to, to let all staff be made, made aware of this, uh, and just in terms of you know, best practice and training of staff. So first off, to consider you know, who the document is intended for. So the reader might have, for example, a, a cognitive impairment. Uh, uh, such as dyslexia or autism, uh, and then to provide uh, you know, a full glossary uh, for technical language, you know, jargon, uh, you know, abbreviations, uh, and complex, complex terms um, uh, in, in a form that's accessible, obviously. Uh, you know, it may seem, this next one may seem a bit sort of like common sense, really, uh, but to just simply write in clear and plain English, uh, the, the crystal mark um, for, for plain English uh, is actually a very, again, a very useful website for that side of things, and that they have tools that will help you actually check you know, your content. Uh, but that's very important for, you know, particularly for people who, are, who have cognitive impairments. So just moving on now. Um, it's also important in your uh, Microsoft Word documents to use uh, uh, headings and styles. So, for example, I'm sure you've all used these, you know, H1, H2, H3, et cetera. Um, and then to also ensure that you use sufficient color contrast. So that's you know, for text and background colors. Now, this one is, um, it's important to, 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 to be aware of this. In, in, in many sort of documents I've seen, um, uh, it's essentially having text over images. Now, from a, from a sort of a design point of view, it's, it's great because it, you know, it's just sort of, you know, like a visual, but if you're actually uh, wanting to convey um, uh, you know, uh, critical information and then you provide uh, text over an image, it can actually interfere with the text um, and make it much more difficult uh, to read uh, for many users. Um, so I think also just to point out as well here that if images are, um, just in the document for aesthetic reasons, uh, you'd need to mark them as, as decorative. Um, so essentially those, those are images that are just there to, you know, like, like on the slide, for example, um, you know, the, the, uh, word, the word icon, it's just there to, you know, to improve the aesthetic of, of the slide, um, but I actually marked it as accessible. So this was, was a, you know, an accessible PowerPoint slide. So just moving on now here, we're going to uh, talk about the, um, uh, the use of uh, MS Word uh, accessibility checker. And so definitely recommend using this. And I've provided again a link here in the slides to, um, uh, to the Microsoft website. And it gives you a very thorough uh, breakdown as to how to use the accessibility checker and uh, also to um, uh, alter any uh, issues or problems that you might find. It actually gives you like a, a, you know, a guidance on that. I'm now going to just provide a short demo and hopefully uh, you'll be able to hear this. Uh, please let me know if, uh, if any, anyone can't hear it. In this demo, you will learn how to add alt text to an image. Select the review tab. 
select check accessibility. The accessibility pane opens and displays the error for missing old text. Select the drop down menu. Select add description. Type in a meaningful description, so for example, from kitten looking up. It's best to use punctuation in alt text. This makes the text sound more natural when read by a screen reader. Select accessibility. You'll notice the inspection result. No accessibility issues found. now save your Word document. Once you've done that, then go back and select Info. Type in the title of your document. For example, type in Example 1. We will now save the document as an Adobe PDF. Select Save as Adobe PDF. dialog box appears, simply select yes. And then save your PDF where required. So hopefully, hopefully that was helpful um, for for for, um, for for viewers. So just want to now uh, to talk about uh, alternative text descriptions uh, and also hyperlinks. So uh, it's important to ensure that uh, alternative text or alt text descriptions uh, are added to images and that 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 the text is meaningful. So for example, in that you know in that kitten um, uh, you know. Uh, demo that we just saw, uh, if you were to have you know, a picture of uh, a tiger instead, uh, but the alternative text was, was that of uh, this is a kitten, it wouldn't be very useful, would it? So it's, it's worth just checking the meaning of alt text, because I, as far as I'm aware, there's, there's, there's very few ways of being able to check that automatically. Uh, also that uh, uh, WebAIM provides you know, useful hints and tips and guidance about writing alt text. Um, and then another aspect that we'd recommend is to keep uh, your tables and documents you know, really simple. So avoid things like merged cells uh, and ensure that your tables have uh, header information. Uh, it's also important to, to add meaningful hyperlink with, within, within text. Um, so for example, uh, you know, as we mentioned with the, the website of things is uh, to avoid terms such as you know, click here. It's the, the same uh, true for, for Word documents and, and even PowerPoint documents for that matter. So, okay, uh, moving on now to uh, just talk very briefly about templates and accessibility checker, uh, uh, checker rules. So that's just to say that, and I'm sure for many of you have probably realized this, but uh, Microsoft Word uh, and PowerPoint particularly, uh, you know, offer accessible templates. Um, so it's, it's useful to use those as a, as a starting point. But just to bear in mind, though, that um, uh, particularly, uh, you know, if, if, you're, if you're not used or familiar with, with ensuring that your documents are accessible, even though you might have an accessible template, it's actually quite easy to make it inaccessible. Uh, if you don't have some sort of familiarity with accessibility when, when creating documents. So just to point out too that the rules for the accessibility checker um, that Microsoft uh, provide you know, really useful documentation um, and they, it, it's for the rules for the accessibility checker and uh, it's used for Microsoft Word, PowerPoint, Excel, Outlook, uh, OneNote and Visio. Uh, so it's, it's, worth, it's worth looking through that. And again, I've provided a link for you. So in this uh, part of the, of the presentation, I'm just going to, to, to talk about, uh, you know, is your website accessible? And some of the things that you need to think about and to be aware of. So for example, you know, is your website compliant to uh, the public sector body's accessibility regulations? Um, you know, is your website uh, usable by disabled people? 
um, uh, the main barriers to web accessibility, you know, awareness uh, of um, accessibility features, and uh, you know wh whether a user is non-technical, for example. So, you know, is your website compliant to PSBAR? You know, that again, that's a, for many public sector organisations. They should be. They should be by now, uh, but. Um, you know, not necessarily every single one will be. Um, so it's worth it's worth looking into that. Um, so just to say, state that all public sector body websites must be accessible and compliant to WCAG 2.1 level AA. And then also to just to to ask this question: Is your website usable by disabled people? Um, so I just want to give you an example here because you might think, okay, well, what, what does that actually really mean? Um, so if you had a, a web page of a thousand accessible URL links, um, you, know, you know, that people can click on, um, for someone who is a screen reader user to, to listen to each of those URLs would be actually quite tedious um, and it would take them a very long time to go through. So what would actually help is to, you know, to, to group or to uh, categorize the links with headings. So this would allow the screen reader user to navigate the required content much, much faster. Um, it's rather, I suppose, like using an index or a, you know, a contents page, you know, that, that sort of uh, method of navigation. So moving on now to uh, talking about the main barriers to web accessibility. So, so these are actually quite, quite important uh, and, and particularly from a sort of a, you know, a best practice point of view. So um, we'd recommend that you, you uh, essentially that uh, for, for a disabled person, for example, if, if they're not able to, um, to navigate a web page by using a keyboard, so that creates, you know, creates obviously a, a major barrier. Uh, also the ability to be able to adjust color contrast you know, such as altering, uh, you know, text and background color on a web page, uh, and also having a screen content read aloud. So, for, again, particularly using a screen reader. So, for example, uh, you know, we, we saw the alternative text descriptions uh, for images um, uh, uh, in, in a document. The same is true for for a web page, of course, as well. Um, so that again can cause a barrier. So, so. I, Two other additional barriers to, 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 to think about is um, in terms of magnification or zoom uh, you know, of the information on your web page. Um, it, it's quite a simple thing to, to ensure is there, but for, for many websites, they actually turn the zoom function off um, and that uh, you, you need to ensure that that doesn't happen. So essentially just you know, any user can in, enlarge the information uh, to at least 200% or more. Uh, and then also just simply to find relevant help, help information on your website. Uh, that's also uh, really crucial uh, and is one of the uh, web content accessibility guideline uh, criteria. So just to point out that, uh, uh, for example, a, a user may need to uh, alter font size, but they may not actually be uh, aware that this relates to digital accessibility. Uh, so it's just to bear that in mind. It's also important to realize that, that users may be non-technical and require information, you know, support or training on demand. So uh, just to give you a, a point here that um, you know, at, at Microlink, we, pro we provide a, a platform that uh, uh, can actually you know, uh, teach or help people to, to, to learn how to uh, make accessible content, uh, digital content. So what I'm going to do here now is just to talk about why all your documents must be accessible. So I'm going to cover, you know, uh, the PS bar in terms of PDF accessibility, uh, the main barriers to, to PDF accessibility, um, Acrobat Pro DC and the accessibility checker, and using Adobe Acrobat Reader itself. So just to, to point out, and again, I'm sure that um, many of you would probably be aware of this, but just to be sure is that PSBAR requires that PDFs published after the 23rd of September, 2018 must be accessible. Um, and so this also includes third party content. You know, so if you've, if you've actually paid for it, that, that's important. 
so the uh, again main barriers for uh, you know disabled person uh, if, if, if they're not able to you know navigate a PDF uh, by using a keyboard or gestures so if you know if they're using a mobile a mobile device as well um, you know, and certainly in terms of uh, adjusting color contrast such as you know altering um, uh, text and uh, background color in an e-reader application. I'm sure you've probably all, you know, um, used uh, the free Adobe Acrobat Reader DC on, on a mobile di device, for example. That's just an example of, a, of an e-reader. Also, it's important that, um, you know, to, uh, you know we're, in terms of barriers to consider is you know whether a disabled person is not able to have a P, you know, PDF text read aloud. So, for example, when uh, using a screen reader uh, such as NVDA or uh, read aloud um, in the browser or in an e-reader app, uh, it, it also includes text that describe uh, images and uh, and this is you know, referred to as alternate text descriptions or alt text. So I'm now going to, to provide a, a short demo of what it is like for a screen reader user to experience um, uh, the barrier of no alt text being provided. Heading level one reading screen content allowed using NVDA. The following is an example of an image without alternative text, alt text, description. This causes a barrier for screen reader users. Heading level two, example one, blank. NVDA did not recognize the image of the kitten because there is no alt text description. If you are blind, you would not know there was an image. This is not accessible. Graphic cross. So hopefully that gave a, a, a helpful uh, breakdown of, of what it would be like for a screen reader user to experience a problem with um, not having alternative text description. So just moving on now to uh, to talk about um, you know the, sort of some further barriers as well. So just two two remaining is uh, in, in, to ensure that. Um, yeah, so for, for a disabled person, it's, it's whether they're, 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 they're not able to, to magnify or zoom the information uh, in an e-reader app, you know, such as a Adobe Acrobat Reader. So it's just the same as with the website, but this time you know, actually using a, uh, you know, an e-reader on a, on a mobile device uh, and or even on you know, a, a laptop as well. Uh, again, it's also important to be able to, uh, to, to, to allow the user to find information uh, in an e-reader, you know, particularly about accessibility. Um, so that's that's important to realise if you if you've you know if a, if a person is going to be using something like a Adobe Acrobat Reader, just simply to make that information you know available on your website. So it's important, you know, just to be aware too that when you export from MS Word or Microsoft Word to Acrobat Pro DC, uh, it's not always reliable. Um, so just to to ensure that you, uh, you you even though you might have exported a, an accessible document, um, you still need to check it in Adobe Acrobat uh, Pro DC. It's it's important to do that. Now Adobe also provide a, a really useful guide on uh, all the different sort of aspects that you might need to affect, uh, to fix and you know how to actually go about doing that. Um, just to point out though uh, that. A Adobe Acrobat Accessibility Checker is helpful for easy fixes, uh, but much, much more difficult to use for complex problems. Uh, and I've I actually spoke to, uh, to a client uh, this afternoon who uh, expressed that very same uh, issue. Um, and just said, you know, when, when it gets to the more sort of fine grained, um, you know, where you have to go and actually alter or change, you know, tagging, et cetera, it can get really quite tedious using Adobe uh, Acrobat uh, Accessibility Checker. So I'm just now going to give you a very short um, uh, demo for fixing the title of your document in Adobe Acrobat Pro DC. Um, so these these sort of demos are just to really give you a bit of a, a bit of a taste of what uh, what might come in the in the workshop um, uh, at the beginning of March. So 
Sometimes saving a PDF from Microsoft Word is not always reliable. The title, example one, we added in the Word document may not be carried across to the exported PDF. In this demo, you will learn how to fix the title of your document in Adobe Acrobat Pro DC. Select Accessibility. Select Accessibility Check. Select Start Checking. Select the document drop-down. You'll notice three issues. Right-click on the title failed. Select Fix. In the description dialog box, uncheck Leave As Is. Type in the title of your document. In this case, example one. Select OK. You will notice title failed changes to title passed. The remaining two issues, logical reading order and color contrast, need to be checked manually. For reading order, we recommend using a screen reader such as NVDA. For color contrast, we recommend either the color contrast analyzer by TPGI or the website Who Can Use. So what I want to do here now is to just to uh, draw your attention to this. Uh, for some of you, you may be aware of this, to others perhaps not, is, uh, and this is particularly useful for when using Adobe Acrobat. Uh, reader uh, is that they have now provided a, uh, a feature called liquid mode and that essentially enables you to alter font size, letter spacing and line spacing. So you know, even just using that you know, personally, um, it, it, it's, uh, it'll, it'll help you um, so that you don't actually have to, uh, to horizontally scroll uh, along a sentence, for example, um, particularly if you're using like a mobile device. Um, it's just a really useful feature. And it, it essentially, it, um, uh, it wraps text uh, around uh, or reflows the text so you can actually read it. But just to be aware that um, uh, reflow, uh, certain aspects such as tables, things like that don't actually reflow. So it's mainly just for reading uh, purposes. I think to, uh, to now to just to, to close and to provide a, a, a take home uh, message. Um, I know that you know, for some of you probably already at home, but it is my, my, my take home message. So um, essentially is that uh, you can make a difference by creating accessible digital content. And you know, it can actually, in, in, it may not seem like a lot, but it can actually make a big difference to, uh, to, to many disabled users um, if you just are mindful of that. Um, and also that uh, just by hopefully by through this presentation, but to, to increase awareness of digital accessibility and the uh, assistive technologies available uh, out there, uh, but also just to encourage you to share this with you know, friends and friends and family, you know, uh, relatives, etc. Just you know, if, you, if you come across, say, for example, like that liquid mode, tell other people about it. Uh, it, it, it does make a difference. Um, and I think just in the closing statement that essentially everyone benefits, particularly during and after uh, COVID-19. So you, are, are there any questions? No, thank you, Neil, that was uh, amazing. Thank you for a good, very brief, um, well, it is brief because it's such a complex area, but it's uh, very informative and, and thank you for that. You're very um, welcome. Uh, one thing uh, you touched upon, which is really important to um, re-emphasize, uh, making uh, websites and, and um, you know, information is accessible it itself is a huge uh, task, but very rewarding task to get more engagement from your customers. We often create a lot of content even after our website or, or our information is um, <clears throat> made accessible by people who are not really accessibility experts. So if you look at a university sector Absolutely. where lecturers keep producing new material, they don't really know the principles or they don't understand the need for accessibility. 
Now, that's obviously a, a very important area where each organization has to reach out to all their workforce to get them to do their part in this uh, um, uh, you know, task. And by that, giving them those very easy to do tasks, how to check their accessibility of documents. And certainly, as Neil mentioned, uh, we developed that uh, platform specifically for teaching people who are not accessibility experts how to go and uh, make sure a PowerPoint is accessible, all the clicks on the Microsoft 365 or any other product they, they use frequently. And the second part, which is um, you touched upon very um, briefly at the end um, in terms of you know, during the COVID, uh, everyone now is basically having to learn digital skills, whether you're old age pensioners or, uh, or school, you know, um, uh, children in school, because uh, we've moved to the remote learning and remote uh, services. And to be able to ensure everyone has access to the accessible information is as vital today as it's ever been. So like your PDF documents. So you might have tons of this information, very useful information that you created before 2020, 2021 but you haven't really made it accessible uh, and you've removed it from public site. Well, it's not helping your customers. It's definitely not helping the public because, you know, just imagine NHS has got tens of millions of useful documents, information, guidance for people. If they're not available, then the public miss out. So that effort of going and making those accessible, again, it could be a huge task, but it is an important, essential part of making sure we do engage and involve, involve the full population, not just the able few. So again, that's something that we certainly would like to help advise and guidance. Anyone has that issue, reach out to us, and I'm sure Neil and his team can help you to try to resolve these um, challenges. Um, I've got a couple of questions. Yeah, sure. Sarah Flay says, can anyone recommend a free reader for MacBook? NVDA isn't compatible. For MacBook, okay, uh, it should have a, a built-in uh, voiceover, so that should should be free. Yeah, so voiceover. Yeah, a native Mac uh, voiceover does uh, cover anything uh, designed for Mac. So it's, if it's created on Mac, um, but I'm not sure if if there is a document created, uh, an inaccessible document, it will do a very good job of it. So so yeah, it's all down to whether that document was created accessibly, but certainly the voiceover is a great tool and is used, used by many, uh, well, almost all the blind people I know use uh, um, iOS and, and Mac devices because of that voiceover. One of the things I'd like, you know, because I, I design um, everything for, for Microlink. I do, I'm the, the in-house graphic designer as well as marketing manager. And I, there are, you know, I, I just, learn to design in a certain way and now I'm learning all these tricks and tips and things like this I mean I didn't know about the accessibility features before I started working for Microlink so I'm on a learning curve too are there any just quick things like for example I, I one of the things that stuck in my head um, is a camel case where when you're doing a hashtag for example on social media you always put the words even you know because when you're doing a disability confident or accessibility and inclusion, you usually just write it as one word. But if you don't put those capital letters in, a screen reader just reads it as a blah, 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 blah. So even just putting the capital letters in, that's such a, an easy, quick takeaway. So is there anything, Neil, that you can, you know, I mean, I, I think in colors now, I think, oh, I can't put red on blue because, you know, uh, somebody who is colorblind or has low vision won't be able to see the difference in that. So all these kind of things, you know, I, I now think accessibly um, and that really helps me to design. It, it could be limiting, but it's not actually, it actually challenges me. So. No, that's excellent. I think like you say, just, you know, even just simple things like making sure that you're using correct heading styles, things like that. Uh, it's, mm. it's so important, particularly for screen reader users, uh, because if, if a document isn't headed correctly, uh, it, it actually makes it very difficult for them to be able to navigate through it through a document. Um, so in, uh, in, for example, you know, NVDA or JAWS, um, and also, you know, voiceover and others, is that you can actually pr pr uh, press 
um, it's like, you know, just basically one, two, three, four, and five, and six on your keyboard. And that will actually navigate through to, to different uh, uh, heading levels uh, based on the number that you press. But all these kind of things you're going to cover on the 1st of March sure. in the workshop. Yeah. That's so it, I, yeah. I, I mean, don't miss that, guys, because Neil is going to walk you through. And, and even if you just take 1%, you know, and, and start improving your documents and your website and whatever, just 1%, then you're helping um, the call. So please don't miss that. Um, you should be able to register on the, on the DWP um, newsletter that went out. I, 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 would, I would really go further and say, you really want to see the benefits of accessibility. Just imagine you spent a long time creating a blog or an article, publish it, because of the pressure of work, uh, people just can't get time to read everything. Yeah. If it was built, if it was made accessible, they could click a button and it will read it to them while they're driving. So you could imagine your content would get actually more um, um, interaction from your readers than if you didn't make it. So that this is really why it's not just about giving access to disabled people. It's actually providing this to a wider audience. And they could be disabled by the situation, by the workload, or whatever that you can consider a challenge for a person to engage with your material. So really, it's the principle is, once you do it properly, so, a lot more people will benefit from, from that than uh, the very, uh, some people uh, consider a very small population of disabled people. Also, I think I think I got to just add to that as well. Now, so yeah. you know, this also includes you know the, the aging populations, you know, all, all yeah. of adults, you know, all, all of this type of assistive technology will, will, will help people. Um, also, just uh, you know, um, things for example where where people might be at work. If you know if you're working and you you're, you're starting to get tired towards the end of the day, for example, um, there are certain actually you know assistive technologies, particularly for reading text, that will actually help uh, you, know, uh, you to be able to read things more easily. That you know even though you might be tired, um, so it's, it's just just those sorts of things like that that can help. So Peter Wadsworth said, um, he, he, I think he might have been get, helping us there. He said, command and F5 for Mac voiceover. There we go, yes. Uh, and then Nicola Barrett says, please, can you send on, how can she get one on her website? Uh, so what, what, uh, She said, please, can you send me how to get one on my website? Thanks. Okay, so is so this, that is this a, a voiceover? Uh, okay. Just yeah, just to point out, is that is that from Nicola? I think that must be from yeah, Nicola that, Barrett. That's it. Is just to point out, you can you can get plugins for websites. Mm -hmm. um, that uh, I'm trying to give an example now. There's one called like Recite Me. Um, yeah. or, also, there's there's, there's, there's one or two. Other, bar. There is there's a, 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 that's right. Eight eight bars and excellent one as well. Yeah, um, and, and and there are just, uh, yeah, Facilitate is another French one. It's very good, but but there's no replacement for doing it properly. Exactly. Just, exactly. just a bit of plug-in doesn't really uh, yeah. give you the full feature, so it's a bit of a half-hearted attempt. Uh, certainly, it's, it's, it's okay to just get by until you fix it, but it's not a solution for a long term. Absolutely. I think as well, just to say that it's, and it's also not a replacement for a screen reader. Um, of course. So, you know, it's, that's, it's just, just to make that really clear to everybody. So, personally, they have their place, but I would, I would use them very sparingly and to just be very careful when you do use them to understand the, you know, the implications of what, what you're doing with them. Correct. Yeah, so if there's okay. nothing else, we're almost on the hour. Thank you, Dr. Rogers and Dr. Siabi. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> All these PhD doctors around me. <laughs> One thing, anyway. Um, well, so we'll, we'll see you on the 1st of March for the workshop and, and you can, it'll be live so you can ask Neil whatever you want about your digital accessibility um, challenges. And, and even uh, send us questions in advance so we can. Oh actually, yeah, so we can Actually that would be a good idea, yeah. yeah. That would be a really great idea, yeah. Yeah, go ahead. Um, should, I, should I put your, um, I'll put your uh, email in the, in the chat. That's yeah. fantastic, thank you. Okay, thank, thank you everyone. Thank you and goodbye. And take care. It's great Thank to you. see you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.